Okay, so the today's webinar is microbiome modeling in KBase. So uh, if you, uh, those of you have attended the previous webinars, uh, the modeling webinars, the intro to modeling webinar, like a couple of weeks ago, some of these slides are familiar. So bear with me so I could properly orient everyone that's um, listening to this webinar for this presentation. So um, talking about microbiome modeling, let's talk about metabolic modeling in general, why we use metabolic modeling. It's a, another tool that uh, we can address important scientific questions uh, relate to metabolism. So you have organisms and then you sequence and you get functional and structural annotations. With structural and functional annotation, you get some idea of the genomes that it says pyruvate synthase, glucose dehydrogenase. But when you build, when you compose those functional annotations into a biochemical reactions and building metabolic network, then you can ask questions like, okay, what pathways does this uh, exist? What pathways uh, does it have fluxes? So active in a certain environmental conditions, what is the impact or the predict or impact of genetic perturbations? If the uh, certain organisms are not culturable in the laboratory, how we come up with a, a minimal media fibrillation or media fibrillation for those strains? Or how we can optimize a certain strain to produce a uh, uh, chemically important uh, chemical uh, or industrially important chemical or industrially important biofuel. So we can answer that kind of questions so in, the, in the context of microbiome modeling. Uh, we can ask questions that uh, how it is resilient to its native ecosystem or what are the trophic interactions that uh, the cross-feeding events that um, uh, that it does to survive in this native environment. So, uh, so metabolic modeling is a great tool to address these scientific questions. So what is a metabolic models? So uh, there's three main components to the metabolic models. As I mentioned earlier, this has a, a, a metabolic network that consists of reactions uh, and compounds. We will, uh, I will talk in a second how we derive these biochemical reactions from uh, uh, microbial annotations. So it has this metabolic network, then it has what we call in the modeling terms, a, a biomass function. So the typically the biomass, uh, what we call an objective function. Typically the objective function in models is the biomass because many scientists, they want to simulate the models for the growth. So it's important to mention here, the objective function doesn't necessarily need to be the biomass. It could be the excretion of acetate or excretion of a biofuel like ethanol. So in that case, what you, the objective function going to be an excretion reaction that is try to optimize the model to produce ethanol or uh, another biofuel. Typically the objective function is the biomass because you are uh, simulating the models for the growth. So the biomass function consists of uh, these uh, essential components in the cell that made the cell biomass of amino acids, nucleotides, lipids, cofactor cell walls, and energy. So this biomass is experimentally derived. So that's what we are trying to make from a given uh, media. We're trying to produce the biomass by simulating uh, through these metabolic networks through fluxes. So the, uh, just like a cell growing in a petri dish, uh, the models also need a, a, a media formulation that it's uptake these uh, compounds from the media formulation and run through this metabolic network and trying to produce this biomass. So how we derive these biochemical reactions. So we have these functional annotations. So the functional annotations looks like, so it has a gene and then that gene maps to a functional role, right, this pyruvate kinase, and then we map those functional uh, genome annotations to a, what we call a complex. So the, the concept of complex is very important. For an instance, this function here, the pyruvate kinase is a, is a uni enzyme. We map to a complex and that will map to a biochemical reaction. But what about the enzymes that have subunits like the NADP transhydrogenase subunit alpha and beta? So in this case, two open reading frames or genes map to these functional annotations and then we map these two functional annotations into a single complex. 
and then we add these reactions into the model. So if one of the uh, functional annotation is missing for some reason, then we do not add these biochemical reactions into the model. That's why the concept of complex is very important. We make sure all the subunits are present in order to add uh, these biochemical reactions into the model. So the once you have the model, uh, what you get is a draft metabolic model. When we derive a metabolic model based on the functional annotations, from that point on to improve the um, accuracy, when we simulate the models, you need to have more measurements or experimental data integrate into the model. So this is a, a cycle that you have um, the omics data or growth uh, phenotypic data that you integrate into the model and then, uh, then, then try to curate these models and through multiple cycles, you can improve the accuracy of the predictions. So, um, so the flux balance analysis is, is the FBA models as the type of the model that we discussed today. So the flux balance analysis is a mathematical approach for analyzing flow of the metabolites through a metabolic network. So you can see my toy model here. And you can see that a nutrient uh, coming into the cell. So let's, let's imagine for a second that this is a glucose, uh, com glucose molecules coming into the cell at a certain rate, uh, in this case, the rate of 10, and it's producing a pyruvate uh, or some other component down in the, uh, down in the pathway, which is the uh, biomass. So you can see in this toy model that it's a linear pathway and it's, it uh, maintains the same rate that it converts from compound one to compound two to compound three and so forth. So it's in flux balance analysis that uh, in, in uh, steady state modeling that we assume that no internal metabolite is allowed to accumulate, no degrade. That means when you generate a com intermediate compounds like compound two and three, that does not get degrade or accumulate. So the, the rate of the reactions has to be maintained and has to be balanced. That's why you see that it's a certain compound comes into the cell at the rate of 10, and that rate is maintained until it produces this uh, end compound for the biomass. So at its steady state, the rate of the reactions are equal. But the, the more, uh, more practical scenario is that the pathways are not always linear, it's branches out actually. It looks like a, more like a hairball in the actual metabolic network. So it can, a compound can come into the cell and, and can get oxidized into multiple pathways. Like for an instance, glucose comes into the cell and then glucose can get oxidized via uh, glycolysis, the internal deuterof pathway, the pentose phosphate pathway, and it can produce byproducts and also uh, contribute to producing the biomass. In that case, so here it has three separate routes that it can get oxidized, a certain compound. And if we imagine the carbon source like glucose comes into the cell at the rate of 60, you can see that these rates are now divided. But if you accumulate all the rates, uh, 30, 20, and 10, it's, it's uh, adding up to 60. So the rates are again balanced. So that's, that's what I meant earlier. So the, at steady state modeling, the intermediate compounds cannot be degraded, nor accumulate. It always has to be, the rates has to be balanced. So, however, uh, however, so one of the uh, main issues that we run into is that these metabolic networks has gaps. This is true even in the case of E. coli, which is probably the most studied organisms in the organism in the universe, that uh, many scientists have studied E. coli for a long time, still uh, part of the chromosome. We don't understand what those, uh, what those genes does. So that, uh, that generates these metabolic gaps, the, these knowledge gaps that we don't know what it does. So in order to have a functional model, we need to fill these gaps. So the reason is that as, as uh, I mentioned earlier, if you have a gap, so the reaction rates, so now it, the compound A cannot be converted to compound B, this creates a gap. So the flux balance uh, analysis does not work. So because these cannot be accumulated or degrade, right? So 
so we need to we need to fill these gaps so the the way right now so this is, um, before I get into that, this is another representation of uh, metabolic network. And we have these end products and we have this metabolic network, a carbon source can come into the cell and provide all these intermediates. And then we have these metabolic gaps. And so it cannot produce these end compounds. So we need to fill these gaps. So the, the way right now we fill the gaps in, in uh, K-base is we, um, we have these reaction databases that we collect from, uh, from the third party databases like KIG and Metasig. And uh, we have a controlled vocabulary that we map all these uh, database reactions and compounds into model SIG ontology. And then we try to uh, derive a minimal set of reactions to fill these gaps. That is the strategy that we uh, fill the gaps. There are many other ways to fill these gaps. Some scientists experiment, okay, the pathway-based gap filling, so they decompose the metabolism into individual pathways and try to fill these gaps based on pathways. There are other strategies. Right now in K-based, the strategy is that we derive a minimal set of reactions to fill these gaps in order to get these end compounds and satisfy the biomass. So in the context of microbiome model, so we have microbiome sequence and then uh, we can assemble this sequence into context and then we run through annotation pipeline. And um, then we create a metagenome model. Now, uh, keep in mind that so the metagenome has multiple organisms in it, right? So, so the metabolism that represent in this metagenome um, in the metagenome model has, uh, has, has all that uh, metabolism composed into one compartment. So what we uh, can address in this case is that what is the, uh, the scientific questions that we can address is that what is the overall metabolism in a, in a, in a microbiome? And uh, what does it uh, excrete out of that microbiome? What kind of a carbon sources that it can degrade? So that kind of questions can be asked from a microbiome metabolic model. So if you want uh, to build a, a compartmentalized metabolic model, so this is a, a scientific question that you can ask. So I have a metagenome and I want to get the most high abandoned organisms out of my metagenome and then create individual metabolic models and then merge these metabolic models into a compartmentalized metabolic model and then ask questions like, how do they survive? What are the cross-feeding events? What are the trophic interactions? And so to address that kind of questions, you can build a compartmentalized metabolic model. And when we build a compartmentalized uh, uh, metabolic model, we take into consideration right, relative abundance. If you pick the most six or most uh, three high abundant organisms, and then uh, these relative abundance factored into when we construct the compartmentalized community model. Here in this example, you can see that I have three members and the relative abundance is 5.5, uh, 0.3, and 0.2. That is all um, adding up to one. So that will reflect uh, when we try to produce the biomass uh, because the, the for the biomass equation, these um, relative abundance get factored in as and coefficient. So it's try to produce more biomass for the high abundance organisms. With that, um, I would like to uh, leave my PowerPoint presentation and go to the uh, narrative workflow that we try to present, that I try to present today. So the link for the uh, narrative is, uh, should be on the Google Doc up here. And uh, I suggest that since many of you are uh, here, let's see how many, uh, how many of you are here. Um, there are large people, number of people attending the uh, webinar. I suggest that uh, all of you don't open this narrative, rather watch the presentation for now. And later, uh, this will be recorded. The presentation will be recorded and later. You can open the narrative. So um, uh, we don't have to overload the system opening the narrative, everybody open the narrative at the same time. So this narrative, if you go to the narrative dashboard and if you go to the section um, of the public narratives, then you can find this narrative. So if you, if you just search for microbiome modeling, um, 
in the public uh, narrative section here microbiome modeling it should come up and then you can open this narrative and um, what i am covering today in this narrative is that i have two sections and i want to cover the section 1 if i have a uh, time at the end i would i would like to go over the like, section 2 as well which shows how you can upload omics data and integrate with the models but the my target today is that at least cover uh, cover the section 1 so uh, in this narrative we build a uh, model based on a metagenome and then we analyze individual beings from that metagenome so to uh, to for this narrative uh, we to get those the metagenome and the individual beings there's a reference narrative here that uh, i have opened that reference narrative here this is the narrative that we use to process that metagenome and uh, derive those individual beings so here that um, we have a, a sequencing data for the metagenome and so this is the pipeline that we uh, that we have uh, used in this narrative that we have these uh, sequencing reads we assembled those sequencing reads from a metagenome and then we uh, went through binning and then uh, we annotated those bins and uh, so those are the uh, metagenome and bins i'm going to use in this narrative so i'm i'm not i don't plan to go through this narrative today but i i would uh, just uh, quickly walk you through so uh, i i have used multiple assembles assembly algorithms to assemble the sequencing data and uh, we have uh, QC tools to uh, access the uh, assess the quality of the assemblies, and then use uh, we have binning tools in KBase like MaxBin2 and uh, MetaBat uh, to uh, bin the assembly. And so once you bin, now you could see that um, previously it was a single assembly. Now you could do, uh, you could see two assemblies, and then um, I also used IDBA. And once you have uh, individual assemblies, you extract these assemblies and then you annotate. And once you annotate, it's like an any isolate genome that you can uh, pipe those annotate, uh, annotated genomes into any apps that you could do genome comparison or metabolic model building. So you can check this uh, narrative out. The link to this narrative is from the presentation narrative here. So you can click here to open that narrative and that will show uh, that will uh, walk you through how you uh, get a sequence of a metagenome then assemble annotate bin bin extract and uh, annotate individual uh, annotate those individual bins so what i have done here is that i simply have copied that metagenome here so what about this metagenome so this is actually a, a mix isolate so uh, the reason we picked a mix isolate is that if you uh, if you run through this workflow if it's a large metagenome it takes a lot of time so if a mix isolate in this particular mix isolate has only two bins so all the apps that we are going to uh, we have in this narrative and in this workflow run faster because it has only uh, two bins in that small mix isolate so specifically, we uh, select the mix isolate for presentation and uh, hands-on uh, hands uh, workshop purposes. So, but you can have a metagenome and run through the same workflow and get your analysis done. I also want to point out there's an intro to metabolic modeling tutorial that is out there. So uh, many of you have seen this uh, presentation and this is very helpful. Um, so let's see, I have opened this one. This is very helpful if you, if you are a beginner to uh, uh, metabolic modeling. So this will give uh, all the, the basic concepts of how, to, how you build a draft metabolic model and uh, run flux balance analysis. There's lots of text here explaining each step and what flux balance analysis means and how do you build a media formulation and um, 
what each of the uh, fields means, like the OV reactions, compounds, genes, gap filling, uh, what's the biomass, and uh, what's the pathways. So all these uh, lots of text, useful text given in this narrative. So um, meantime, just um, follow through that narrative as well. So in this particular workflow, what we have, what we are doing is that I have imported a row assembly into this narrative. Now, how can I do that? So all of you, you can see that in this narrative on the top left hand corner, you have these uh, data objects. And if you click this arrow, that will open a data pane that has five tabs, my data shared with me, public example and import. So what I have done here is I went to shared with me. It takes some time for me to load because I have tons of data, but for you, it should open up uh, pretty quickly. So if you go to shared with me and then um, search for CCESR 16 IDBA assembly, I, I could see all my uh, data object that was shared. So this narrative is right now public and shared with all of you. So if you type CCESR 16 IDB assembly, it should come here. So all I did is I just copied that row assembly into my narrative. So um, something to remember is when somebody uploads a data and that person shares with you, you can access that shared data through this tab. So all I did here is I just copied that row assembly into this narrative, and then I'm, I'm uh, then I can run my analysis based on that assembly. So the first app that um, I have used here is that annotate metagenome assembly and re-annotate metagenomes with Rast annotation pipeline. So many of you are uh, probably familiar with the Rast annotation pipeline. It's been there for um, a long time. Uh, but that Rust annotation pipeline is specific for, uh, it's isolate specific uh, annotation pipeline. So this new annotate metagenome assembly uh, and re-annotate metagenome with Rust TK app is a, a modified version of that annotation pipeline. This is optimized for metagenome annotation. So the typical uh, Rust annotation pipeline that is uh, isolate specific one, if it sees the large context or, or large number of contexts, that it may fail. So this, this um, pipeline, this new app, it can take a assembly, a row assembly file or annotated metagenome assembly, that is uh, assembly that's already annotated. And it can take either of those input and then it, and then it will, uh, um, then it will use, under the hood, it will use the prodigal gene caller to call genes. And then on top of that, it's populated with the seed subsystem technology, uh, seed, uh, seed subsystem functions, and then annotate that uh, assembly or annotate metagenome assembly and produce an output uh, that has a functional role. So let's see, I... I um, annotated metagenome assembly for, so this is the object that it, it creates uh, once, it's, uh, once it's annotated through this Rust annotation pipeline. So you could see here that if you click the browse features, the second tab of this output, you could see the Rust functional roles, the feature IDs. So the under the hood, it, call, it uses the prodigal as the gene caller and it calls genes and on top of those genes, it will annotate with these functional roles, which you can see in this, um, in this output table. So once it has Rust annotation annotated functions, now we can build a uh, metagenome model based on those uh, Rust, based on those annotations. I, I should also mention that if you um, want to uh, add other annotation ontologies that there is an app that uh, Lawrence Livermore people has developed. It calls, uh, you can search any annot annotations here that I'm switching this to beta because that app is still in beta stage, uh, bulk annotation.
for some reason I could not get that uh, app. So um, okay, so bulk input annotations from staging. So this app, if you want to populate other annotation ontologies like Go and uh, EC numbers or other or keg, uh, keg annotations, you can use this uh, this app and populate those functions in the, uh, in, the, in the genome. So going back to this pipeline, so once you have a, an annotated genome from the RAS, now you can build a metabolic model based on those annotations. So the app that we use for that is built metagenome model app. So it takes the, the input assembly, the annotated metagenome assembly that we created from the previous app or individual bins. If you have bins that you can uh, have the uh, the bin object also as an as an input to this app. This takes optionally reads coverage, and this is an optional field. So uh, the reason and it, it does take this reads uh, reads file is that it can store this read coverage at the uh, reaction level or at the quantic level in the model object. So this will be useful for uh, downstream apps and number of apps that we are being building. So we can factor in those reads and the quantity coverage for certain, uh, so certain analysis. This will also takes a, a media formulation as an input. So this can run flux balance analysis. Based on that media, we can gap fill as I showed in my PowerPoint slides based on a, a minimal media. So this will generate a uh, draft metabolic model and then gap fill on this glucose minimal media. So I named this draft model GP GMM for, for glucose minimal media. And this output will show all the reactions. If you go to result and see this report, this output show all the, res all the reactions that were gap filled. And um, so I can open this um, Okay, so yeah, so and, and it, it will also give the uh, all the reactions that were added. And if it's changed the reaction, but not added as a new reaction that will also give that uh, information here. And uh, so that will generate a uh, output model and then display the data in this output uh, model uh, table that will show individual reactions, the reaction name and the biochemical equations. It will list all the compounds and the genes, uh, for some reason, it doesn't show up the gene here, and the compartments and the biomass compounds and also the gap filling. And in this case, um, it has done the glucose minimal media gap filling and it's also uh, composed a uh, list of uh, pathways and these are kick pathways and it will uh, show the, the the EC numbers, the reaction that were mapped to this EC numbers presence based on this color. So very useful output here. And then um, what we do is that we import these bins from that reference narrative. So I'll, I'll again go back to uh, point to this, um, okay. Point to this narrative that I showed earlier so this narrative also has these individual bins. So remember I, men I mentioned earlier that we assembled the metagenome and they, we binned with the max bin two. So that, will, that gave us two bins from this uh, reference narrative that you can take a look at later. And so just like I did earlier, I went here with the shared with me and then copied those bins. So you could see that um, uh, CSS, e, uh, CSS ESR 16 IDBA and uh, bin 001. And so I could see these individual bins. So I just simply copy these bins into this narrative. And that's, uh, that's what I had here. Um, so here you have this drop down that I can filter uh, by the object type. So if I, if I filter by the object type here, the genome, I could see these individual bins, uh, CS, uh, CCESR IDBA bin 01 and B02. So those are individual assemblies. 
So those individual assemblies were then annotated and I copied these, those annotated individual assemblies into this narrative. Now I can build uh, metabolic models for individual bands. So for this, I use this uh, app called build multiple metabolic models. So you can build uh, metabolic models in bulk with this app. So I have uh, added both the bins into this app and then I want to gap fill this particular, um, uh, particular models with the carbon uh, with uh, glucose minimal media. And um, I'm selecting the template as automatic selection. So uh, there are other options here that somebody wants to build a gram negative, gram positive or plant or a uh, reduced version of the model that represent just the core metabolism. But typically it's, it's safe to select automatic selection because we have a uh, classification algorithm based on the uh, genome annotations that we decide whether that genome going to be gram negative, gram positive. So I suggest you select the automatic selection and then we built uh, these metabolic models in bulk. And then uh, if you go onto the data tab and then uh, select metabolic FBA model, you can see all the, all the metabolic models that were built in this narrative. So in this case, it's, it's these two objects that um, I named with the, uh, the postfix FBA model. So what you get is two models representing these two bins. Now, now we have two bins and um, now we want to characterize uh, these models to uh, generate statistics. For this, uh, we are using an app called Run Model Characterization. Um, okay, Run Model Characterization. So the input for this app is that those uh, bins, that annotated bins, that um, annotated and uh, the models that we constructed from the early app. So you can see the input here is the FBA model and the, the metagenome with coverages that uh, we have built earlier. And that's, that comes here. And then uh, we run this app and that will generate a uh, very rich report, if you go to result, you can pull out the report, a very rich report that show the model statistics for that particular bin. So here it shows the total reaction count, uh, compound count, uh, the core gap filling, the base gap filling, the oxytrophy, uh, base ATP production, all the overview stats uh, that are very useful. And it also uh, decompose the pathway statistics. So here the, it's, 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 uh, this, it's uh, shows the data by pathways and all these pathway links actually open up to uh, cake maps. And so this pathway categorized by the keg ontology. And uh, so it shows the total number of reactions for each pathway and the fraction that is complete. So based on the fractions that it, it uh, predict whether the certain pathway exists or not. For an instant here for the phenylalanine metabolism, the fraction is uh, very low. And so it predicts this pathway may not exist in this particular, in, in this particular bin. And it also gives the oxytrophy statistics. It gives a list of compounds from the model and it predicts whether that compound be oxytrophic or not. So in this case, it's, it predicts that the glycine be oxytrophic. That means it cannot synthesize glycine by itself. It has to, um, if it needs glycine, it has to uh, uh, probably take from outside uh, as, a, as a nutrient into the cell. So similarly, similarly, we have run the run model characterization for the uh, second bin and uh, generate the statistics, the similar statistic for the second bin as well. Again, if you go to the result tab, you could see all these statistics in the report. Now, uh, now we generate the statistics for the both the bins. And so now how we compare these bins. 
and try to derive uh, conclusions, try to derive, try to address, try to ask important uh, scientific questions based on the comparison. To compare these bins, that first we create a model comparison template. So the, the way that create a model comparison template is that we use this create model comparison template app. And uh, so uh, to, to fetch all the models that you want to compare, you can, you have options here. So the, I, I have selected the current narrative. So it pick, uh, it pick all the models in the current narrative for the comparison. So you have other options that you can select all personal narratives. So it will, it will consider all the, uh, your personal narratives and fetch all the model objects from your personal narratives. All, all accessible narratives, that means if somebody shared with you or a certain narrative is public, it will consider all those narratives and fetch the modeling object and then create a model comparison template. So the model comparison template is is something like um, something like this. So I have a, a put a link here in the step six that if you open that, um, I'm going to uh, save this. It's going to look like this. It's going to uh, generate an Excel sheet, a spreadsheet like this. All it's going to have is the your models listed here, and then the models names also listed, and all these columns will be listed. So how do you get these columns? So this data here that I have put it, all the metadata that I want to put it. How do you get these uh, columns listed? So in this app, so I'm going back to my narrative, you see these metadata fields, you can, you can put any metadata fields that you want to have. So in this case, I put the completeness, marker lineage and contamination because I want to have these stats from the, um, the check in results from that uh, reference narrative that I uh, showed earlier. So from this, from this uh, reference narrative. So these are the stats that I put for uh, this presentation, but uh, one can put any number of uh, data fields into this in, in here. It could be 50 fields that any metadata that you want to have, and then that will generate a template spreadsheet like this. And each metadata field would have uh, generate a column with the heading, and then you can fill in this metadata. So the, the app will produce the spreadsheet with the model, na model name, model reference, the column headings, and then you can fill this metadata. So once you have this spreadsheet, you can save that into your machine and you can go here, open the data pane and go to the import panel. And then you can drag and drop this uh, Excel file. So let me try to do that. So I have here my uh, template that I've saved onto my machine. And then I can drag and drop here and once it, uh, you can see now it's, I can see that files appearing here. So then I go to this app that called import TSV Excel file as FBA model attribute mapping from staging area, which I select that file here. So let me reset this app so I can demonstrate how it's been done. So whatever reason, um, Okay. Okay, so whatever reason, so I, I think I um, broke the kernel uh, for some reason and I do not want to um, refresh this page uh, for, for now. So once you have this app, you can select that file and then you can upload that into the narrative. So once you upload that into the narrative, it will save in this uh, object called model comparison attribute mapping, mapping of object. So, uh, okay.
All right. So for the model comparison app, it takes this model comparison attribute mapping object that that has your list of your models that has the metadata associated with it as the input. That's the only object that it takes as an input. So then the model comparison app runs and generate this uh, generate this uh, report, which is a very rich report that uh, that generates this heat map. So the, this heat map is uh, based on the Plotly uh, graphing package. So all the controls that you have under Plotly is it's it's available here if you mouse over. And uh, what you see here is that on on the y-axis it will give the list of uh, pathways. These are based on the uh, click pathways again. And on the x-axis, it will show uh, the uh, all your bins and all your metagenomes. In this particular case, what I have done in my template is I included my metagenome and my individual bins. So I can compare the metagenome to individual bins. So since this has, uh, for presentation paper, uh, purposes, we have only two bins in this case, but if you have like imagine you have like hundreds of bins. So I have an example, unfortunately I, can, uh, I can't share that with you because it's private data, uh, but I can show you here. So this one have about 60 bins in this particular example. So uh, you have these the uh, metabolic pathways on the Y axis and about 60 bins on this. So you can see a very rich analysis that it shows, uh, it renders the, uh, the functional reactions, that means the, uh, the reactions that has fluxes that are active in this particular environmental condition or media condition. And, and there are a number of ways that you can analyze the data. So you can uh, get the Z-scores and see the variations from the mean and uh, for each particular pathway. And uh, so you can see the total uh, for, uh, okay, that, that didn't come out well. Um, and the gap filled uh, reaction. So these are the reactions that were gap filled in this, uh, uh, in this particular media. So if you have a, a media like glucose minimal media, so the sole carbon source is just glucose and it has to produce all the biomass compounds from that sole carbon source. So there's lots of reactions that are gap filled. If you, if you use a rich media formulation like uh, LB, then most of the compounds are available for you to uptake and satisfy the biomass. So you can see all these uh, very rich analysis using, um, using this heat map. And it will also give the overall statistics uh, and uh, reaction classification comparison. And um, so the and it has, it has uh, also um, the functional, total functional coverages. So that's why we kept the reads coverage in the first place that when we uh, generate the, the metagenome models and then uh, store those reads coverage. So this is one of the apps that we are trying to use those reads coverage. So I, I should also mention that these are beta apps. So that means we are still uh, vigorously testing these apps. So I'm not surprised if some of the apps doesn't function sometimes. That means we are testing and we are fixing it and we are going through those cycles. And uh, eventually we will release these apps soon. So, so that's how you could compare uh, individual models. So you could compare hundred plus bins right now and 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 uh, derive these conclusions uh, and try to address your scientific questions and also these heat maps can be your figures in in your publications so um, in this workflow the last app that I want to show is that if you have high abundant organisms in your metagenome you can pick the most high abundant organisms and then generate a compartmentalized community metabolic model. So here I am uh, generating a community metabolic model based on the two bins that, uh, that I have uh, built models before in this pipeline. And so I select those two models here and then um, there's a checkbox to say a mixed bag model. So I don't want a mixed bag model. I want a compartmentalized metabolic model. So by default it builds a compartmentalized model. And once you uh, run this app, what I get 
uh, is a com uh, it's a compartmentalized metabolic models in this case uh, because it has only two bins i could see c1 and c2 the two compartments and so uh, these are extracellular and uh, for every metagenome uh, every compartmentalized models you have this compound c0 uh, which is the which is the um, community biomass as i was explaining uh, at the very beginning in my powerpoint presentation so you could see here that this is the community biomass that the coefficient is one and the by default for the individual two bins that c1 and c2 it's it's uh, splits evenly that the the coefficient or the relative abundance is uh, is 0.5 so you can change this relative abundance if you know the relative abundance of your community the high abundant members you can make the first one 0.9 for an instance and the second one 0.1 adding up to 1 so that reflects when you try to simulate when you try uh, when you try to simulate the model and producing biomass that will uh, factor in and that will take into account for the simulations so the reactions here just like before but now uh, notice that each reaction you will see this uh, c1 that's the the compartment one for the first member uh, the in this case, there's only two members, so this is the um, uh, this is one of the members, and you can also see uh, some reactions that appears as C2. So if I search for C2, you can see some reactions that um, represent the second compartment. So the output table is, is is very similar to the individual metabolic model output table, that it will show the overview and then the reactions uh, genes that were um, individual genes that were mapped to particular reactions, compartments we have already gone through, and the biomass we have already gone through. And it will also show if there's any gap filling and also the show the pathways. So that's, um, so I think I have uh, 50, uh, I have 10 more minutes. So I would like to show the uh, second uh, section of this narrative, which is very helpful that you can upload and integrate uh, omics data so uh, in this particular example that I have uploaded a um, E. coli genome and then got this uh, omics data sets from this particular paper, the transcriptomic data and the metabolomics data, you could do the same for your metagenome if you have uh, metabolomics and transcriptomic data. Uh, so what I have done here is that I have uh, imported a genome. So here you have a link to the E. coli genome that you can download the GFF, uh, the, the GenBank file into your, into your machine. And then just like before, you can drag and drop that uh, GenBank file here. And then uh, once you have the GenBank file, let's see, I have a GBK file that I can. Yeah, so I have um, GBK. So if, if you have a GBK file, so if you go to this uh, drop down and then select the GenBank genome option, and then uh, you can bring that app to the, uh, to the narrative and then you can upload that genome. So I have uploaded that uh, Escherichia coli K12 NG1655 genome. So once you have uploaded that genome, you can see the statistics of that genome and overview and then what I have done is that using, using the typical RAST annotation pipeline. So the RAST, annotation, the RAST annotation app that we use in the top of this narrative is a modified version for optimized for metagenomes. What I'm using now is, it's, uh, so, um, is the regular RAST annotation app. So, and um, I'm re-annotating this genome. So what it does is, that it takes the genome as an input, this annotate microbial genome, it preserves the original gene calls and it's annotated on top of previously called gene calls with the RAST annotations. So it does not call genes. So it, it, uh, it preserves the original gene calls. So once it annotates, so you can, again, you can see the RAST annotation functional roles and also you could see the other ontological terms on that, so you can also browse any functional roles. All the output tables in KBase are searchable, so uh, you can uh, search any interested function uh, like pyruvate synthase. If it has it, it should has it. It should has it. 
um, you can search any functions. And then um, I have also link here for the transcriptomic data. So this is an, a, a matrix that has the transcriptomic data and using import TSV file as expression matrix from staging area. You can import the expression data here uh, using this app. And um, so if you see the output that it will show uh, the expression data once it's loaded into the narratives, the condition. So it has six conditions and then it has the individual features, the functions and the normalized transcriptomic data. Similarly, you can load the metabolomics data. Here again, I have a link to the metabolomics data file that you can save into your machine. So if you can right click and uh, save link as, it will save that into your machine. Then you can then drag and drop that into the import area. Then use this app and select the file. And uh, then you can upload that uh, the metabolomics data into the narrative. So the metabolomics data also here that it has six conditions. And uh, then the each individual row list, the compound, the compound name and the normalized metabolomics data. So I have then built a metabolic model. So again, this is the, the regular metabolic, uh, build metabolic model uh, app uh, that we have for the isolate, uh, isolate genome. So I have used the Rust annotated isolate genome here and build a draft metabolic model and then um, gap filled on uh, glucose minimal media. Then I have run the flux balance analysis based on that uh, minimal media. So here I gave a, a description about the flux balance analysis. These two are very good publications that if you want to get an overview of what's FBA and what's flux variability analysis, um, you can take, uh, you can check that out. So I run a flux balance analysis producing a flux distribution on uh, glucose minimal media. And I'm doing all that because I want to see the uh, I want to see this expression data, the metabolomics data and the flux data on a, on a pathway map. So here I have links to a, a pathway maps that we are working on right now in KBase. That, um, so here you have the link for the aromatic amino acid biosynthesis uh, map. So these were maps were drawn based on the Asia uh, tool that was developed at uh, UCSD. So similarly, uh, just like before, you can download these apps into your, into your uh, machine and then upload uh, those maps into the KBase using import JSON file as Asia map from staging area. And then this app, the Asia pathway viewer, this is still a prototype app that we are working on. So I have loaded the um, aromatic amino acid biosynthesis map so that I can open this report in a separate window and I can blow it up a bit that you can see that this is um, right now by default, it's, it's the uh, flux distribution that it's painted over this map. So you can see the, uh, the, the central metabolic pathway, the pentose, path, pentose phosphate pathway has the high intensity of fluxes and this it fades out going into the end product. So that's a typical, how a typical flux distribution would look like. But if you see, if you want to see the expression, so if I flip this into gene expression, now it, it shows the high expression, uh, high expressed reactions versus low expressed reactions in this path they mapped. Similarly, I could show uh, the metabolomics data. So this is actually um, the TCA cycle the flux distribution and also the gene expression uh, painted on the pathway map. So going back to the central metabolic, going back to the uh, aromatic amino acid biosynthesis. Now these circles shows the metabolomics data. So going back to the full screen view. So the intensity and the size of these compounds shows the metabolomics data, the presence of the metabolomics data and how it got mapped to this particular pathway. So this is very useful to see what metabolites were mapped to your metabolic model 
and how the comparison between the flux and the expression data and also the metabolomics. And that's all I have uh, today for this presentation. And um, in the next few minutes, if you have any questions, we can go through the questions. Yeah, thanks, Janica. There's a couple of unanswered questions if uh, you wanted to give your thoughts on those. Okay. For natural microbiomes, metagenomes, what is the best practice for the choice of media for gap filling, such as microbiome and cultured? So for this, uh, there's a, there is an app that you can derive the minimal media and uh, then uh, use that, the, it's also called the, uh, the oxotrophic media, that you can derive an oxotrophic media so that it's identify what compounds are also oxotrophic for this particular model, and then get, try to gap fill in that particular media. So, um, I mean, we can answer this question later in, in detail, um, mentioning what apps to use. So I'm quickly trying to go through these other questions. How is the relative abundance of different organisms accounted in the model? So this is um, this is what I showed um, earlier in this in this uh, example. That uh, you have to know the relative abundance from the uh, sequencing data. So the this relative abundance once you know the relative abundance, it will get factored into. Um, so if I go up. Um, so here I uh, earlier built a compartmentalized community model. So in the biomass, so this is the coefficient of the relative abundance. So the relative abundance get factored into the community biomass. So we have a community biomass that the relative abundance of each member of that community adding up to being the community biomass. So if you have relative abundance, you know that 90% of your community consists of one organisms, you could have 0.1 here. So that is, this is, that some uh, user can edit this parameter. So you can uh, adjust the relative abundance in your model and then you can simulate. Okay, uh, could we use this to model soil microbiome under different agricultural practices? Um, that's that's a uh, that's a more complex question. So, it's it's if you have different environments, if you know what's the what's a difference in the environment, and if you can factor that different environment into your model. So, what is the environment look like? What compounds and environmental conditions that is it aerobic? It is is it anaerobic? Those can be factored into model simulation. So you have to know the you have to know the conditions what you want to simulate with. Okay, what reads were used for reads coverage tab in the metabolic model? Okay, good question. Um, so the reads coverage. So the uh, so the the reference narrative. If I go to this reference narrative, so this narrative, the reference narrative that process these um, metagenome and individual beans starts with the reads coverage. So the, you can upload the reads. You can drag and drop the reads file here. And then you can upload the reads uh, into the narrative. That's where it starts. So once you have the reads, uh, then you can assemble, then you can bin, bin extract, annotate, and build metabolic models. So we, I did have the reads, file, the reads object in this uh, narrative. So what I did, in the presentation narrative today was that I, just like I showed before, I went here and then I copied that reads file uh, into my presentation narrative. So in this particular case, so it's, it's sample ESSR16. So because I created that narrative, it should be uh, under, my, uh, under my data. So all I did is that I copied that reads file, the reads object into the narrative. Okay. 
what treats were used for okay that's I, can you get any information about extreme environment metabolism like mind drainage so this is this is also depends like if uh, if the metabolism is represented in our biochemistry and if it's if if the uh, the genome annotation represents this particular environment uh, this particular environment metabolisms then it will get mapped onto the metabolic models and you could see those pathways and so remember that oh, the uh, the metabolic models are good as how good as annotations so once you have if you have these annotation represents these uh, extreme environments most of the time it does and is, uh, so it can get factored in it can get integrated into the metabolic models and and some are absent some some uh, some degradation pathways uh, some reactions would be absent and and if they are absent and if you are the expert and you know a particular area of metabolism then you can wire those uh, pathways into the into the your model so here what i didn't show is that there are apps that um, that you can have edit metabolic model it's not the best uh, best uh, user friendly app but uh, what the edit metabolic model app here is uh, that for some reason it, it's not loading for me uh, that you can add custom reactions you can add new reactions into the model so because remember now uh, what you get from the uh, typical annotation is draft metabolic models and then you can gap fill these metabolic models and based on particular media like the in here in in this presentation i gap fill my models in glucose minimal media but if you know a certain um, a certain part of the um, metabolism is missing like here i gap in the glucose minimal media is try, is try to use the glucose as the carbon source and try to produce all the biomass compounds but if you know if you know that if you are the expert of a certain area of metabolism that you can wire that pathway those reactions into the model using this edit metabolic model app and then and then do your simulations if the we don't have the reactions you can add custom reactions uh, wiring those pathways in how many genomes can be added for microbiome metabolic modeling so um so the the for a metagenome model that i showed here so in this presentation what you have is the metagenome assembly so that can have hundreds of organisms uh, in that in that assembly so what 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 we have is a single assembly that you annotate with the rast annotation pipeline and then build a metabolic model so that will show the overall uh, metabolic capability of that uh, metabolic model but if you want to build a compartmentalized metabolic models once you bin the your metagenome assembly and extract those bins this has a limitation this can go up to like i would say like 15 bins maximum this is a optimization problem so um to you cannot have a, a system that it's it's a limitation that you cannot have a, um, a system that go beyond uh, so many models so you can have go up to like 12 or 15 then it's going to get slow down or you are not going to get a solution out of that so that's why i mentioned that if you want to build a compartmentalized uh, community model you have to select the most high abundant organisms from your metagenome and, and try to understand what are these main players in your community does to survive in that environment of the or justifying the resilience in that environment how are bins completed for modeling are only the collective genes considered or do introns and gene distances also play a part in functional characterization no uh, so the um, mostly these are um, bacterial genomes so the introns doesn't play any part um, so the right now the gene distances gene distances doesn't pay, uh, play a part so what we extract bins we run through the annotation pipeline and um, so it's it's uh, we are we are coming up with tools to extract high quality bins 
And uh, so right now the user selects the high quality beans. So we, we are come on, coming up with these new tools that it automatically selects the most high quality beans out of the metagenome. How is pathway completeness is determined? So the, uh, the pathway completeness is uh, right now is determined the number of reactions present in that particular pathway and take it, take it as a fraction. So uh, I, I, I don't have an exact cutoff that we are using. So if it's like, you know, um, 10%, that means if you have 10 reactions in a particular pathway and only two reactions are present, that uh, leads uh, towards think that that pathway mo most likely does not exist in that particular model versus a pathway that has eight reactions out of 10 most likely to be present. What Gaffili media type was used in the metabolic model in the presentation example and why? So the, the media that we use in this uh, uh, particular presentation example is glucose minimal media. And the reason is that when you use the glucose minimal media, you can get the most complete metabolic network. So as I mentioned earlier, so when you use the glucose minimal media, uh, so let's see here, I go and select the media and um, I can just get the glucose minimal media here. Um, Yeah, my narrative is not loading. Let me try to refresh it. So the when you uh, when you uh, simulate when you try to get fill the glucose minimal media, it uses glucose as the sole carbon source. So that's the only carbon source, and you have to produce all the biomass compounds, all the amino acids, uh, uh, the vitamins, uh, fatty acids, everything from that one carbon source. So it try to produce have, try to produce all the pathways and fill all the gaps in, if there's any gaps to produce in those end compounds. That's why we use the glucose minimal media. If I used a rich media like LB, then that media has all kinds of carbon sources from amino acids to uh, vitamins and all kinds of carbon source. In that case, the cell, the, the model won't gap fill any of those pathways. It's rather uptake those compounds and then satisfy the biomass. Can you input environmental geochemistry instead of using media chemistry? If you if your environmental conditions can be uh, can be uh, input as as a formulation, yes, you can. So I don't know what exactly you mean here. Like uh, um, for an instance, you can say uh, in the in the form of media formulation, you can say what carbon sources it present, whether it's aerobic, anaerobic. You can mention all that. So it's it loaded good. So let me show you what. Um, the media formulation looks like. So I'm here um, selecting the uh, media and the carbon D glucose. So here it shows the list of compounds in that carb in that uh, glucose minimal media. So you can see all uh, these elements are there, but the only the carbon source is glucose. So to answer that question, so if you have oxygen, for an instance, then the model will simulate under aerobic conditions. If it has the aerobic uh, respiratory chains, then it will use this oxygen. And if you want to simulate strictly on anaerobic conditions, you need to remove this oxygen. So there's an app called Edit Media, just like Edit Model for the media, there's an app called Edit Media. So using this app, um you can you can have your custom media formulations you can you can remove the oxygen so you can simulate under anaerobic conditions and you want to see whether it can it can reduce nitrate you can have the nitrate in the media you want to see whether it can uh, reduce nitrous oxide or other environmental factors that you are trying to uh trying to factor in So what is a mixed bag model? So the mixed bag model is, is that, um, so in a typical uh, metagenome example, so you have number of genomes, right? So you have, you have hundreds of genomes. So we are composing all that genome into one 
uh, one model. That's the, that's the type of model that, um, that we have built today. So we are building a model based on a single metagenome assembly. So that's, that's kind of a mixed bag. So you have a number of organisms represent uh, different um, types of metabolism in that one uh, compost model. So it's, it's, not a, it's not an isolate model there are, so that's why I call it overall metabolism. So with a metagenome model, you can, you can assess the overall metabolism of that community. So Ben, do we have time to go? Oh, uh, so it's sure. one. Yeah, uh, I, I, if, if, as, as much time as you want. I think we probably stop at 2.30, but uh, yeah. If you want to answer some more or if, uh, yeah, just let me know. Okay. If we re-annotate the genome in K-base by Rust, is that possible to compare this annotation result with the original one in K-base? Um, I am not sure on this one, genome comparison. Uh, ben, do you know a genome comparison app that we have it currently, the annotation comparison app? I am I'm not familiar with that. Maybe they're talking about the, um, the view function profile tool. Um, that's that's kind of what's popping into my head. Yeah, I mean, you cannot compare number of genomes, the number of annotations right now. Uh, so we have this wing, uh, view functional profile for genomes. And so you can have a set of genomes and this will generate a, 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 a chart, right? So yeah, uh, and map, uh, you have to annotate the domains on it using the annotate domains tool, but it will give you a heat map and show you presence or absence of genes based off of certain um, uh, protein family libraries. Okay, so why is the Excel file generator need to be re-imported into um, area step. Why is this not automatic since every other input into the next app is automatic from the drop down? Why does this Excel file once is generated? Okay, good question. So the, um, so he, uh, so the question is referring to um, this step here, create model comparison template. So we, we do not link uh, direct file uploads as an input into downstream apps. So we, uh, so every analysis app, we want to, uh, the input should be a K-base, uh, so, okay. So every, every analysis app, it, the input is, should be a K-base typed object. So that the apps can seamlessly run. So we are. So the question is is leaning on to why you have why you want to have two apps that one app to import a, a TSV file into the system and then another app to use the output of that, which is which is this object, FBA model attribute mapping comparison, and then run the analysis app. So we always want to have a K-based type object as an input. So um, that's why. Uh, we want to have a separate app uh, to get the data from outside into the K-base. We are not linking. So once you have the data object, that data object can be shared, can be used in multiple apps to run the workflow. So, um, so for that reason, and um, we try to get all the uh, import, uh, import files, the external data, into the system first and then use those as k-base objects so we can uh, we can run the downstream apps so we can also keep the provenance with that so we want the, one of the main features in k-base is that it's uh, reproducibility and um, and uh, how it was done so so it's also help us to keep the provenance that how somebody was run uh, used those particular objects and in what order All right, so 
Okay, that's that. Is there another output beside heat maps once you get to the compartmentalized model comparison, such as pathway networks or cell diagrams? Okay, so that this is something we are still working on. We want to we want to uh, come up with an app that shows the uh, uh, the trophic interactions, the uh, the pathways that are complete and incomplete, uh, justifying the these trophic interactions. So this is something that we are working on. Is the heat map function that demonstrates the differences of metabolism in a microbiome community also possible to be used between different experimental groups? created by the same strain under different conditions yes so so each different conditions if you build a, a particular model and a, and a particular flux distribution for each different conditions then it's comparable so all you need to do is that uh, generate these different models with different names and uh, that mapped onto different flux distributions uh, representing representing those environmental conditions and then you can you can use it to compare that uh, you can use that tool to compare is kbase suitable for analysis of virus encoded metabolic genes how about a mixture of virus bacteria and fungi i am i'm not familiar with what um, tools that we have to that encode the virus uh, virus encoded metabolic genes i to my knowledge we don't have a tool that uh, that um, translated virus genes into metabolic functions but we do have for bacteria fungi and plants so one would one could even build a metabolic model that has all these three domains and uh, and do comparative analysis but i am not familiar I, I don't think we have um, virus modeling function at this point in kbase yeah so we do have the capability of uh, fungal uh, to produce fungal metabolic models and also plant, plant metabolic models so um, there are apps uh, so there's an app called uh, build fungal model that you can generate a draft fungal model from any structural annotations so you can upload a genome with a assembly and a gff file and then um, then you can build a draft fungal model and uh, annotate plant and there's a um, there's an app called annotate plant transcripts with metabolic functions and here you can um, build a plant metabolic model and theoretically you can combine these models and uh, can create a system that has bacterial fungal and plant systems in a community model okay Is there's a narrative showing how edit metabolic pathways work for poorly annotated reaction in iron oxidation uh, not specifically for iron oxidation uh, but uh, we can post an example here that uh, that uh, using the um, uh, how to edit the metabolic model so the app is called the edit metabolic model and uh, so here we go uh, so I'm typing here edit metabolic model. So every app in KBase, if you click these three dots and you get this um, link here, and that you can open, and that will go to a page uh, that will give uh, what all these parameters means in the app. So this is a place that you can add reactions, delete existing reactions, add compounds change the biomass if you want to change the biomass compounds and um, so you can simply edit a um, lot of aspects aspects in the metabolic model okay. 
if I want to add other carbon sources to the gap filling media, aromatic compound, what would be the best way to customize to create a new media from scratch? So what I suggest is that if you want to have a custom media formulation, so just select an existing media. So um, one thing I could show is that if you go to the public tab, you have our pub, uh, K-based public uh, reference data. So here you have um, uh, about 125 RefSeq genomes and then uh, microcosm genomes from JGI and the phytosome genomes from the JGI. One of the options in this media, in this uh, drop down list is media. So there is about 530 different media formulations here. And so what I suggest if you want to have a, a custom media is just select a media that is closer to what you want. Like uh, for an instance, um, I could select the carbon D glucose and then copy that into the narrative, which I already have in this particular narrative. And so then select the edit media and, and edit that existing media. It's much easier to, because you have all the minor compounds that you need uh, for, uh, so I have selected somewhere, okay, here. So you have all the minor compounds like all the metal ions, uh, the sulfate, uh, all that that you need for the simulation. And then you can use in the edit media app that you can add additional carbon sources. You can delete existing carbon sources or other compounds that you don't want. I think that's the best way to uh, produce your custom formulation. Uh, that's that's it. Uh, that's all the questions I could see. Awesome. Thanks so much, Janika. Um, thanks to everybody who stuck around for the whole thing. Uh, we'll be posting up the recording as soon as possible. So look for that today or tomorrow uh, in your inbox or on the kbase.us uh, forward slash webinars website. Um, just another quick reminder for folks who are still here to um, check out the feedback form at the top and give some feedback on the webinar. Uh, and yeah, next week we have the, uh, the phylogenomics and KBase webinar. Um, you can register for that on kbase.us forward slash webinars. Um, and yeah, uh, follow us on social media as well uh, at DOEK Base. And thanks so much, Jonica. And with that, we'll close out the meeting. Thanks for watching this webinar. For more webinars and tutorials, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can see announcements for upcoming webinars and recordings for previous webinars on our website at kbase.us slash learn. Let us know in the comments what content you'd like to see in future webinars. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at DOE KBase. And if you have questions or encounter an error when using KBase, please contact the help desk.